Ferdinand and Isabella, and they told him that for dowry, he would have to Christianize by force all the Jews of Portugal. He didn't mean to do it to begin with, but he found himself either or, if you want to marry our daughter and have togetherness of Spain and Portugal, you would have to Christianize all your Jews. So he called them by cheating to the courts, and he said, I would let you live as Jews, but he cheated. He didn't let them live. He sprinkled water on all of them, and he had made them Christians against their will. So all the Jews of Portugal, with no exception, who were standing waiting for the ships to take them away by freedom, found themselves being Christianized by force. The family of Diogo Perez, I probably mispronounced the right Portuguese way of uh, saying it, but it's, we say Diego Perez or Diogo Perez, didn't tell their child, who was born three years later, that he is a Jew. They were all absolutely shocked by this whole course of events because the Spaniards had given the choice to the Jews. They said, you may stay as Christians, but you may live as Jews. The Portuguese didn't give that chance. Nobody was allowed to leave. They baptized all the Jews in Portugal by force without giving them the chance to leave. And not only they baptized them, they did something much worse than that. They took all the children between the age of 8 to 16 or something like that, and they sent them to the island of San Toma in order to make them to Christian priests, to Christian servants of the church, against the will of their parents, against, the, against anybody's blessing. Uh, but the Jews had no choice. Now you can imagine how traumatizing that was. Diego Perez had found out that he's a Jew by a black man from Africa. They were, that was like the new navigation time. Portugal had had African lands in Ethiopia, and they sent, uh, they sent uh, ships to Africa. And when the ships came back, one of the people who were on the ship, his name was, his name was uh, El, uh, David Haveuveni. He said he's a Jew from Africa. He was like a black Ethiopian Jew. He came to the court of the king of Portugal. He had started to talk with people. He learned Portuguese in the time of the uh, navigation from Africa to Portugal. At that time, you had to do, you know, all around. And uh, he talked with Diego Perez, and they started to talk. And apparently, he realized that either he had some Jewish traits or something like that. And he told him, ask your parents. He was a young man, like 23 by 24. He said, ask your parents if you are of Jewish origin. And he went to his parents and asked. And they said, yes, how do you know that? Now we are Christians. We wanted to defend you and not to tell you at all that you are a Jew. And he said, a man came from Africa claiming that he is a Jew and that I am a Jew too and he wants to talk with me. And so on. I won't go into all the details. You can find all of that if you look in any encyclopedia about Shlomo Morfo. That was the name that he had chosen to himself when he circumcised himself at the age of 24, becoming a Jew and learning Hebrew. He was a very gifted man. He was like a judge in the court of the king of Portugal. And he had decided a messianic movement. He said that it's obviously that out of the tragedy of the expulsion of Portugal and of uh, Spain, obviously the messianic era will come. Because the same principle of many years ago, when the temple was destroyed, the Messiah was born, had been adopted by the people of the 16th century who said when the destruction of the expulsion was going on, the messianic era must start now. Out of our pains of horror, a new messianic era must be born. Anyhow, he had met Joseph Caro, the greatest legislator of the Jewish time in the 16th century, and they talked to each other. And when, uh, when later on, he had been caught Diego Perez, Shlomo Morfo, 
was fought by the Christian Inquisition that had been established in order to find out Christians, novel Christians, who were behaving as Jews in silence. The Spanish Inquisition had resented profoundly the idea that any Jew can revoke his Christianizing because for Christians, when you are baptized, that's for eternity, exactly as for Jews, when you are circumcised, it's for eternity. So when Shlomo Morfo, Diogo Perez, was the first Novo Christian who was born into Christian, Novo Christian family, raised as a Christian and been excelling in the court of the uh, King of Portugal, when he had remade himself a Jew, he converted to Judaism, the Spanish Inquisition ran after him. And they caught him. That was, as I said, a very gifted man. He arranged a meeting with the Pope and with the Caesar, and he had all kinds of plans for some kind of cooperation, which eventually would allow the Jews to return to the land of Zion, engaging the people from the Jews of Africa. It was very complicated things. I don't want to go to all the details, only for one thing I'm telling you. He was caught by the Spanish Inquisition in Italy after he met with the Pope and he had been buried alive in Mantova. Because of his high position in the court of the King of Portugal, he was given a chance. He was asked if you, he was told, while he was already on the fire, on the stake, if you would be returning and repenting and saying that you made a mistake that you converted back to Judaism, we would take you off the fire and we would let you be back reinstate you in Portugal. But Shlomo Morfo, Diego Perez, said in front of a huge public in Mantova, I regret profoundly of the 24 years that I had been living as a Christian, not knowing that I am a Jew. I will never repent. I will never convert back to Christianity. You may burn me. Anyhow, I deserve to be burned, to repent on my heavy sins of living as a Christian. It made a great impression. His death at 13, at, sorry, at 1532, after he managed to write two impressive books and to become friends of the Kabbalist of Salonika, he made great impression on the Jews everywhere. The news had come to Adrianople, where Joseph Cabo, the great legislator of the Jews, had heard about it in the night of the Pentecostal Covenant, in the eve of Shavuot, when you're supposed to be very happy and make merriment, because according to the Book of Splendor, this is the day of the Eros Damos, of the, of the being together of the bride and the bridegroom, according to the Song of Songs, it's resuming of the Sinai Covenant. It's the most happiest of days of the Kabbalist calendar. At the very same day, when Joseph Caro was reading the portion of the Book of Splendor about the Sinai revelation, about the holy wedding between heaven and earth, God and the Shekinah and so on, while he was engaged in this merry occasion, he received the news about the horrible burning death of Shlomo Morfo, Diego Perez. He fainted. He lost his, he lost his uh, consciousness because you may not mourn in a holiday. You may not. In a holiday, you must be happy. However, the very bad news had caused him to mourn on the tragedy of uh, the death of his friends. He lost consciousness. And the <coughs> voice had started to talk from his Stroke. The voice had introduced itself. Remember, as I said, he was reading the readings of the holiday of the Chag Shavuot, the Pentecost, which is about the marriage of the heavenly couple, God and the Shekhinah. He was reading it and he lost consciousness and the voice had started to speak from his mouth. People were studying together with him in the holiday of Shavuot in the Eve, and they told us about it. The main witness was Shlomo Alkabetz, the author of Lecha Dodi, who had written about it to all the communities of Israel. Anyhow, the voice 
that had spoken from Joseph Carl's throat had introduced himself in the name of the daughter of Zion from the scroll of lamentation. That's the scroll of the destruction of the first temple. And the voice had said, I am the spirit of the Torah. I am the Mishnah. I am the bride. I am the desolated woman. I am the exiled daughter of Israel. Listen to me. I came to you because you are studying the Holy Torah, you are creating it and recreating it. You, my sons, you, my children, had redeemed me, and you will continue to redeem me by studying and studying and studying and contemplating on the different parts of the mystical meaning of the Torah. Leave everything behind you, go to the land of Israel, and continue to study and pray for redemption. All that this voice had told him while he was out of consciousness. Shlomo uh, Alkabetz, the author of Lecha Dudi, had written it down and 10 other people had witnessed it, and that had started the movement towards Sfat. That's the beginning of Kabbalah Sfat. Many of you who have been in the land of Israel had visited Sfat or had heard about Sfat, in English you sometimes call it Safed, but it's Sfat. It means the place that you contemplate for afar. That's the meaning of the name Sfat. Karo was told by his friends that the voice who talked through, through his throat when he lost consciousness had spoken in a feminine voice, introduced itself as the Shekhinah as the daughter of Zion, as the community of Israel, in a very tormented situation, in the voice of the scroll of lamentation that we read in the Ninth of Ab, the day of the destruction of the temple. The people who had heard it, had witnessed it, and decided to come after Joseph Caro to the land of Israel. They left at 1535 because there was a war between Italy and Turkey. The Mediterranean had been opened in the summer of 1535. In the first boat that was allowed to cross the Mediterranean, Joseph Caro, Shlomo Alkabet, Moshe Alshek had left Salonika, Adrianople, and other places in the Turkish Ottoman Empire and went to the land of Israel, to the city of Safed. Why to Safed? because it is written in the Talmud that the Messiah would be first revealed on the mountains of the Galilee, and the only city in the mountains of the Galilee is Safed. So they went to Safed, waiting to the Messiah to come, to the Messianic era to start. That's the way that the Kabbalah of Safed had been, had been uh, established. Between the year 1535, to 1575, in those 40 years, Joseph Caro was the major teacher, the major inspiration, the only first person who had a divine voice speaking in him since the days of the Bible, when the sages said after the destruction, there is no more prophecy, there are no more written books. Remember I said 24 and no more. There is no more vertical revelation, but Joseph Caro, the greatest teacher of the law, was the greatest teacher of the Jewish mystical tradition, the new Jewish mystical tradition, based on the assumption that the divine law is speaking in him. He was a great teacher of the divine law, of the halakha. He was engaged all day, all night, in expounding and editing the law after the expulsion for the benefit of the whole community of Israel. The voice that had been speaking in his throat at 1533 in Adrianople had continued to speak in his mind and he had written a huge book called Magid Meisharim, the uttering of the angels who speaks to him for, uh, uh, sorry to translate Magid Meisharim, and you know, it's like, the right word uh, utterances or something like that. It's part of a verse from the Bible. I am the almighty God who speaks unto you uh, upright teachings. So he had believed and all others around him had believed that he is the new Moses, 
where God is speaking to him. This Shekhinah that had been invented by the Kabbalists at the 13th century, based on the Shekhinah that had been invented after the destruction of the Second Temple, had spoken directly in the mouth of Joseph Karo as the oral law, as the community of Israel, as the daughter of Israel that had to be redeemed, all of that in his mind, in his voice, and he had written it down. And his students were the other Kabbalists of Tzfat, the well-known men. And in the year 1572, Isaac Luria had come to Tzfat, and he was the next stage of Safed Kabbalah. He, he lived in Tzfat for two and a half years. Joseph Caro lived in Tzfat for 40 years, from 1535 to 1570. Karo was the great teacher of Safed Kabbalah, and he was the great inspiration of all the great books that had been written in Tzfat in those 40 years. And in the very end, Isaac Luria came from Egypt, from Ashkenazi family, and he had written a new stage of Kabbalah. In three words he said, the world is broken because the heavens are broken. The world had to be restituted by human action. It's upon you to restitute the world by doing all what I've said. Doing the commandments, doing the study, doing the justice, doing communal responsibility, continue to teach your children, continue to study, to interpret, to take responsibility on the 70 days of freedom, on the Sabbath, the old, old things. Only now you do it to hasten redemption. Now redemption didn't come. But those 40 years of very intensive Kabbalistic teaching in Safed had nourished all the communities of Israel because there was one most important thing about the angelic voice that had been speaking in Carl's mind. One point of interest. The voice that he had heard always introduced itself in the feminine voice as the Shekhinah as the Mishnah, as the oral law, as the community of Israel, which are all words in the feminine uh, body according to the Hebrew language. However, when Karo is recording what the voice had said, he says, the voice had told me in the masculine voice. So it is like masculine and feminine in his consciousness at the same time. The voice is always speaking as a feminine. I am the community of Israel, I am the oral law that speak unto you. But in English, when you say speak, you don't know if it's man or woman. In Hebrew, you know definitely. Ani hadoveret, that's feminine. Ani hadover is masculine. It's always ani hadoveret. I am the one who speaks to you because it is the Torah that speaks to him. It is the community of Israel, the eternal heavenly community of Israel, which is woven out of the oral law, being continuously created by the Jewish members of the community. Now, all of that had been written down in a book called Magid Meishari, The Upright Saint, and had affected tremendously all his students who had created new rituals. Anyone who is Jew among you knows what is Kabbalah Shabbat. The Jews are celebrating every Friday by the song of Shlomo Morfo, the student of Yosef, uh, sorry, Shlomo Alkabet, the student of Yosef Karo, which talks about, let us welcome the bride of Shabbat, let us, the beloved one, the male beloved, is welcoming the female beloved. It is like the representatives of God and the Shekhinah. That had been fashioned in Tzfat. That had been created by Shlomo Alkabet as a result of the voices that Yosef Karl had heard. Mysticism and ritual and ancient teaching and communal inspiration are all bound together. The Jews who had witnessed the renewal of the divine voice in the, of, in the character of Yosef Karo, who was the major legislator of the 16th century, had benefited from one thing that his voice, divine voice, which he calls his angel, his mishnah, his mentor, it's all parallel. 
His angelic voice kept urging him, I promise you that you will publish all your work. Now remember the printing press was utterly a new invention. The printing press had become available only at the end of the 15th century. It was invented in the middle of the 15th century. But it took about 20 to 30 years until it had been disseminated. And as soon as it had been disseminated in Christian Europe, two catastrophes had happened. Martin Luther understood immediately the power of the printing press and it started the protest against the Catholic Church through the printing press. So printing press, Fuss, Mechonat Fuss, the printing press, had been identified with protest and revolution. The Christian Church said, oh no, and established the Inquisition to inquire what is the content of the evil books which are being printed by the Protestants. That's the way the printing press had arrived Europe as a danger, as something that should be inquired or inquired. The Jews said, oh no, this is a divine present. We love the printing press. We want to adopt it. We want to use it. We want to spread every book. But since the church is on our footsteps, we won't print new books. We would, we would start by printing the Old Testament, printing the Mishnah, printing the Talmud, printing the Perth. Well, it didn't work out. Very soon the church had burned the Talmud and had prohibited the printing press for the Jews. But the angel of Joseph Kahn at 1533 had told him, you must publish your book. You must print your book. And every time he keeps telling him, publish, print, publish, print. He was the first Jew known to us who was utterly fascinated by the printing press. Now, there were printers in the 15th century. Most important, first books were printed at 1451, at 1453, very early. As soon as the printing press became available, the Jews fashioned Jewish let uh, Hebrew letters and started to print, thinking that this is part of the Messianic era. The Muslims had said, we are not allowing the printing press anywhere in the Osman Empire. So know that the printing press, which had perceived as divine gift by the Jews, was conceived as a great danger by the press, by the church, Catholic church, was hailed by the Protestants, and was very suspicious by all Roman church, and was utterly prohibited by the Muslims. Remember that when you view today what's going on in the Muslim world, the printing press had been introduced to the Muslim world only at the 19th century. The Muslims had loved calligraphy, that's beautiful writing, handwriting. And they are expert in beautiful calligraphy, and they think that calligraphy is holy. Jews think so too, because until today, we write our holy Bible on scrolls in beautiful calligraphy. It is holy, it is very expensive, it is time consuming, but that's the way every Jewish community is buying and ordering Torah scrolls. You pay a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, it's very complicated. But we never prohibited to publish the Bible. We love to publish the Bible, and we had published it already in the 15th century. The Muslims did not allow anyone to publish with the exception of the Jews. The Jews had special permission, for which they had to, uh, to pay a lot of money, to publish in the printing, to publish only for Hebrew books, only for Hebrew readers, not for Muslims. So, the books of the Kabbalah had been printed early. The Book of Splendor that had been authored in the end of the 13th century and in the first two decades of the 14th century had been published at 15, 15, uh, 1552. The Book of Splendor had been published and republished and republished and the whole entire Jewish community was engaged, had engaged itself to study the published version of the Book of Splendor. In every Jewish community, they would have circles who study these mystical teachings. Now that it had been printed in the middle of the 16th century, 
it became very popular, very popular. <coughs> but at the 17th century, at the 17th century, at the end of the 17th century, after the horrors of the Khmelnytsky massacre that took place in the Ukraine in 1648, 49, and it carried on another two decades, Sabatai Tzvi, a Kabbalist from Smyrna, Shabtai Tzvi, Sabatianism, Shabtau, had said that we must start the messianic redemption because very soon there would not be left one single Jew to be saved by the Messiah because all the Jews of the Ukraine were assassinated. So the Jews were assassinated and new mystical literature had been composed. A more halakhic literature had been composed by the Romanian communities, those who were not assassinated. But please remember, I said in the beginning, Jewish mysticism is a library. Jewish Kabbalah is a library which documents the misery of the vanquished and the assassinated and the exiled and the banished and the tormented and the enforced to convert and so on. But the Jews continue to write and to imagine alternative worlds in which justice would overcome injustice. Light would overcome darkness. Holiness would overcome the husk. Messianic era would replace horrors of exile. Kabbalah always was bound in its very backbone with messianism, with hopes of redemption, with Shekhinah, with all what I've been talking about. It was all a long process of commemorating old teaching, inventing new teaching, re explaining, rewriting, refashioning, recreating, remembering that the only way to survive the atrocities of exile is to engage in playful reinterpretation of the world of holiness and redemption. So the Jews said, said something like that. We look backwards to the covenantal past from biblical days, from Mishnah days. We look forward to the time of redemption. We don't pay much attention to the present, and we never write the history of the place where we live. Jews didn't write history of Germany, history of Poland, history of Spain. They never did that. They said wherever we are, it is secondary and it doesn't matter. We are good citizens as best as we can. We are contributing to every society that we live as best as we can, because we need the shelter of the government. But our minds and soul and hopes are either looking backwards to our biblical past, Mishnai past, or looking forward to the redemption, to the future of justice and peace and equality and all that. In the meantime, we do three things. We do the commandments as much as we can. We are living in Jewish communities which are bound to teach the children to read in Hebrew always, 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 never seizing them. We are keeping the 70 days of freedom as best as we can, and we keep hoping that one day we will return to Zion and redemption will come. That is the story of Kabbalah until the year 1948. Then the state of Israel had been established out of the horrors of the Holocaust, out of the torments of the independence war, out of the misery of 2,000 years of exile, after the state of Israel had been established, there is no more Kabbalistic literature in the state of Israel, in the Jewish community of Israel. Because there is no need for that, okay? Not that that's full redemption, but it's certainly a much better world than what the Jews of exile, I'm not talking on Jews of the diaspora, that's a different story, where people can choose where they live and choose what they do and enjoy every liberty, that's fine. But when I say exile, that means the Jews didn't have any liberty but one. They had the liberty to study, to create, to fantasize, to create alternatives, to challenge reality, to delineate a better reality, 
and to dream on a better world, on tikkun olam, and to engage in it every day, all year, every year, while thinking that by doing that, they are redeeming the tortured Shekhinah, the tortured divine manifestation of the female part of the Godhead, which in turn would redeem the earthly people of Israel who had redeemed the heavens.